tonight, we're very proud to partner with another amazing cultural resource, which is the King County Library System. Many of us discover historical facts for the first time at a library, and many of us have turned to libraries to teach us more about ourselves and the world that we live in. It's been such a pleasure to collaborate with the King County Library System on this program. And here to tell you more is Melissa Mather, who I will turn it over to. Thank you, Rachel. I am a teen services librarian at the King County Library System. Um, for those of you, um, I am a 58 year old white woman with short gray hair and blue glasses, and I'm wearing a blue shirt. And I'm sitting in front of an image of our Renton Highlands Library um, under a very colorful sunset. Um, for background, KCLS decided to expand its adult-oriented LGBTQ plus programming with the hope to further serve the library's ability to serve diverse populations and center traditionally marginalized voices. So a staff member from KCLS and a staff member from MOHI met a few years ago through the Coalition of Anti-Racist Whites. And since the KCLS LGBTQ programming team was particularly fond, of MOHI's Objects of Pride program, KCLS, KCLS reached out to MOHI and we're thrilled to now have this partnership with MOHI and we look forward to continuing to work with them. If you need any further information about KCLS, including the current openings and events, please visit kcls.org. So I get the pleasure of being the first person to introduce my Object of Pride and I'm gonna put my version of what I read back in the day. And it is one of the books from the comic series, Dykes to Watch Out For by Alison Bechtel, who is the illustrator and author. What you'll see on the screen is the collection, what, the book that's in our collection, which combines all of her, um, the whole series of Dykes to Watch Out For. Um, I was introduced to this, to this series through the now defunct Lesbian Resource Center, which ran this column in its monthly newsletter. Um, and Alison Bechtel began this column in 1983 and continued it till 2008. And then um, during the 45th president's era, she, she introduced a small um, piece in her, in a Vermont newspaper, kind of continuing that series. Um, and what's interesting to me now looking at it um, through through my eyes in 2021 is that Alison Bechtel's character represented such a wide variety of age and race and so socioeconomical and political positions in a way that in the past couple years, um, a lot of the publishers have tried to, you know, there's a big movement for diverse books and Alison Bechtel really was doing this um, well before it was a focus. Um, what is very wonderful is that Alison Bechtel went on to write two graphic novel memoirs, one about her mother and the second one called Fun Home became a Broadway show and in 2015 it won the Tony Award for the best musical. So it, it's thrilling to think that this series that started in 1983 that not very many people probably knew outside the lesbian community is now um, someone who is um, internationally known. So that is my object of pride and I will um, pass it back to Rachel. Thank you, Melissa. I have to say I am a huge Alison Bechtel fan and especially of the musical Fun Home. Very well, very good, I like to hear that. And, and I did one of, uh, one of the first books I read when coming out was all of Alison Bechdel's work. So uh, I appreciate that choice. Um, I just wanna say before I go into the object I've chosen that libraries are near to dear and dear to my coming out experience. Uh, I read my way into coming out when I was in middle school by finding every LGBTQ book I could at the public library. That's so. what we are here for. Oh yeah. <laughs> Much appreciated. So for my object, I wanted to pick something from the Mohai collection. Um, I think it's been really important to me um, to be able to find queer ancestors and know that there are people who came before me who also were gay and um, 
I really love these shoes um, because they are from Shelly. They, well, okay, <laughs> put that <laughs> back. I, I was really drawn to at Mohai, there's a big sign that says Shelly's Lake is a gay bar and gay is uh, underlined. And it's iconic for being um, one of the first places that was so open about what it was because for so long you know to go to a gay bar it was something that you had to it was very hidden you weren't able to proclaim it and so I love that sign and I love that we have that proudly on display um, because being able to find those spaces is so important for creating community um, and I love dancing and uh, definitely being able to I think one of the first places I got to go out dancing uh, was neighbors because they had an under 21 night on Capitol Hill. And so we were able to go out before, before we were 21 to go dancing with other queer people. Um, and so I, I love that, that, that tradition continues. So these shoes are in our collection and they were purchased from Bluebeards, which is a retail clothing store, um, that was on the Ave in the University District. And they were purchased in 1974 by Mike Kerr because he wanted a pair of dressy shoes for dancing at Shelly's Leg. And I, I love that, that it's, these are the shoes somebody wanted to look their best to go out on the town. Um, you can learn more about Shelly's Leg, both um, we are reopening soon, so you can come see the sign at Mohai, um, as well as, um, our teens have an amazing, the Maya Youth Advisors, or sorry, Maya, the Mohai Youth Advisors have an amazing podcast called Rainy Day History. And there's a whole episode that looks more at Shelly's Lake. So you can hear all you want about uh, the dancing scene in Seattle and um, disco and disco's ties to coming out and finding yourself and um, how, how those all tie together. So with that, I am thrilled to bring back our, um, our uh, I'd say moderator, our master of ceremonies for this evening, who is going to um, welcome the rest of our guests. So Jose Garcia from the King County Library System. And I also do want to note before we get going that unfortunately, um, due to illness, Jordan Keith, who is one of our speakers, is not going to be able to join us and that uh, we hope to be able to feature her story another time. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, my name is uh, Jose Garcia. I'm a librarian with the King County Library System. Welcome everyone to um, tonight's event. Um, my pronouns are he, him. I am um, a heavy set uh, male working on it. Uh, I am wearing glasses, reading glasses because I am of that age, uh, a black t-shirt, and I am coming to you from not so sunny Palm Springs today. Um, it's actually cloudy and we had a downpour, uh, but we're hoping for sun tomorrow and um, be back in the Pacific Northwest. Um, this uh, this weekend. So again, um, welcome. And as I'm thinking of um, really the objects of, of pride that is the focus of tonight's event, um, I, I'm kind of lamenting the fact that I, I didn't have one um, to share this evening. And I'm going to blame it on my dad. He was one of those folks who picked us up at the drop of a diamond, so we were always leaving things behind. Um, but uh, as I was thinking about it, I, I, am, I should have maybe um, brought some of my husband's um, objects. My husband grew up, um, grew up or actually lived through um, during the 80s, and so he lost a lot of friends to the AIDS crisis. And um, we have several of um, his friends' objects in our home and they remind us of, of the struggle um, and that a lot of folks went through during that time. So um, I will, I, I share with him um, in, in, in at least sharing that memory um, with you. And um, the King County Library System, like many organizations who are embracing um, the DEI movement, I guess you can say, 
um, which is its, its time has come, um, really strives to um, embrace diverse voices, be, um, provide equitable access, and um, be, ha have inclusive spaces. So again, it's an honor to be here. Let's keep sharing those memories, um, else they fade. And um, with that, we have um, some incredible guests with us tonight. And um, first with us, we have um, Chris Emery. Chris is a Fa'afafine um, artist of Samoan, Uvean, Putanan, and European descent, um, honoring the way that movies, video games, and music brought the world to his small island life in Tuituila. Chris wants to create spiritual yet eccentric artistic experiences informed by a love for the surreal, Pan Pacific culture, and storytelling. Chris, you're on. Hi, thanks so much for the introduction, Jose. I want to thank you folks, Mohai and KCLS for having me on. Uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, share my object of pride and my story. Uh, gonna, the first part, oh, uh, for, for you folks, yeah, thank you. There's an image of my objects of pride. It is a pair of faux gold hoops from Walmart against a blue backdrop. Um, and as for a description of me, I am a fair skin, uh, thick uh, Samoan with big bushy hair, and I'm wearing a black sweater, um, a gold chain, and a pair of hoops. Behind me is a blank wall, and up in the corner is a wrap as a curtain. <laughs> um, so getting into it. My object of pride is my pair of hoops. While I've cycled through several pairs throughout my lifetime, it's without a doubt that faux 14 karat Walmart spherical duo remains a staple of my essence. Essence is defined as the intrinsic nature and or indispensable quality of something. But what dictionary speaks of its inheritability where no one being is the originator of their brand of essence? What dictionary speaks of mimicry, the theatrics that go into emulation, to walk and talk like your idols so that one day you may become them, don their regalia, a pair of hoops, a temple, a stage. When my friends and loved ones feel safe around me, feel loved around me, I hope they see the strong island women that molded me, the original queens, high chiefesses, healers, keepers of faith and love, baffling that you could fit all that majesty between a simple pair of hoops. Growing up in Samoa, as that young rebellious femboy, I, I was constantly pulled side to side, um, different American celebrities just looking for a role model to cling to. And it took, took almost two decades to look no further than the traffic of matriarchy already present in my life. <laughs> that to emulate that Pacific brand of femininity is to wear a crown, a suit of armor, and to see your intention mapped out step by step as, le as left behind by the ones who came before. Uh, with that little uh, poetic moment, I was, um, I was speaking on, uh, I guess my role models and hoops come into play because Typically these role models always donned a really cute pair of hoops. Honestly, a queen is a complete without her pair of hoops, period. Um, what's it called? These role models in could include, you know, anyone from my teachers to a grumpy auntie at church to my mother, my aunties, grandmothers, older, older uh, cousins, whatnot. And when I say women, uh, please be mindful that I'm also, that I, also mean trans women as well in that respect. Um, I, I chose a pair of hoops as my objects of pride, not just because of that, but also because um, they tend to be a bit of a map for me, um, kind of leads me back to who I am. Uh, to explain that, I guess you could say, um, I'm still, even to this day, I'm still struggling with my queerness. 
I guess um, the years of constantly being told that I was just confused, um, that, you know, I'm living a life of sin, that I've been led astray by some kind of malevolent satanic force, um, you know, shit like that. When you tell a kid, oh, forgive me for my profanity. I'm not sure if I was allowed to swear here, but um, stuff like that, you know, I, I don't know how anyone can tell a child that stuff like that really sticks with you. But um, each time, and I've had several moments where I've kind of hit a low point, um, forgotten who I was. Uh, and that, what that looks like for me, if you've known me in the last few years is my limp wrist turns into a very stiff clenched fist. Um, my, I guess maybe this is me being big headed saying this, but my sultry <laughs> femme voice um, becomes this very uh, unapproachable um, performance of a low masculine voice. Uh, I lose my sway in my walk. I'm more quick to anger and irritability. And I'm honestly crying a lot more in those periods of time. And, uh, but I've noticed, uh, mapped out in pictures of myself throughout the years, I've noticed that every time I've come back to who I was, um, felt proud of who I was, loved myself, um, a pair of hoops was always present. Uh, a good example would be in Hawaii. I was going through one of those um, low points, say 2018 going on, going on late 2019. Uh, I had lost a pair of hoops and I had moved back in with um, my family. While I love them and give them all the credit for doing their best to raise me in, in a way that they saw would be the best for me. Um, there are, you know, you just kind of reel yourself, reel, reel yourself back into that closet. Um, you know, the door is always just halfway open for you, no matter, no matter where you are. Um, and maybe that's just on me for not, uh, for not really having one of those big, grandiose moments of uh, standing up for myself. But um, I'll get there. Uh, and. Around that time, definitely wasn't feeling like myself, um, burning a lot of bridges, uh, feeling more and more shame and just not really in my, in the right head space, not thriving, not being, um, the, excuse me, not being the queen that I have always dreamt about being that I know I am, um, that my loved ones and friends deserve to have in their life. Uh, a pair of hoops always showed up to show me the way. And whenever I see a pair of hoops, like I've said in the poem, I always saw those strong island women. And like I said, please uh, remember that that also includes trans women. Um, there's something in their walk, in the way that they speak, in their strength, their humility, um, their quickness to love and putting their compassionate foot before their combatant foot. I've always um, emulated that in my, I guess, journey in my, um, uh, when I'm being myself, I feel more like um, I'm walking in their footsteps and uh, a pair of hoops is never absent from that. I feel like that really completes the look. I feel like that's part of the armor. Um, I feel like that is the one, uh, that's the one little marker for me of a safe place um, as an auntie with hoops on. And I've noticed even in recent days going to work on days where I'm not wearing my hoops, I'm not feeling like myself. I'm uh, kind of slower and more hesitant to um, be my full self on those days. And when I have my hoops, um, it's as if I have all my aunties behind me, my sisters behind me, the gals behind me. Um, I feel safe and I feel loved and I feel like myself. And um, while they might not have some kind of historical um, significance or really mark an event, um, I want to say that without a doubt, hoops, no matter what pair of hoops for me, hoops is home, hoops is love. Um, these hoops are my aunties, my mothers, my ancestors. 
and I really loved, I, I'm sorry, I forget if it was Rachel or Kelsey who said it uh, when, she's, when she was speaking about um, searching for ancestors who are also queer, who are also like us. Um, for Islanders in, let's say, in the days uh, after the arrival of missionaries, we had a lot of uh, military, naval, and our um, and uh, missionary photographers taking photos of our ancestors. Uh, typically, really disturbingly, uh, I guess, staged photos of say uh, my ancestors in grass skirts, um, posing uh, deadpan in front of some drawn tropical backdrop. Uh, a lot of those photos, it's it's hard to sort through them and really see an image of, I guess, an image of where this person that you're seeing, you can tell that they are queer or there's some sort of marker or, or indicator of their queerness. It's a lot of um, just very, you know, uh, pretty bland uh, images of cis couples, cis matriarchs, cis patriarchs. Um, and there's not a lot written about their sexuality, which is understandable. It was a lot of white Christians who were taking these photos for them. But um, that has been the struggle pretty much was how do I feel, uh, I guess you could say, how do I try to feel valid or try to look for validity in myself by looking to my ancestors by looking to the past and um, photos of my queer ancestors. God, if I could have like five or four of, of like who, whoever these queer ancestors are back to, like back then in the islands, I would love that. Um, but I guess the search is still on um, and there's no use waiting for validation from the past. You have to sit here and love yourself, uh, connect yourself to your community put on that pair of hoops and live in togetherness, live in 100% um, you. And uh, yeah, just really never forget where you are. And if you ever do, just put on a pair of hoops. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just wanna thank you guys so much for this opportunity. Uh, I, I hope that this, this story sufficed. <laughs> um, I, this has been, the uh, even just writing this out and giving this thought uh i feel like i've really hit a few milestones um thank you guys so much thank you thank you chris um what an incredible story and um thank you again for sharing i um i have i have um some follow-up questions but we're going to save those um towards um the end um i would love to hear your thoughts on some of those so um, we had two panelists who were unfortunately not able to join us, um, but I still want to acknowledge them. Um, one of them was um, Jordan Keith, and Jordan is the City of Seattle's 2019-2021 civic poet. Um, so Jordan Imani Keith, she's a student of um, Sonia Sanchez, she's an essayist. She's a playwright, naturalist, and an activist. She's also the recipient of the 2018 Americans for the Arts Award. And she is also the founder and director of the Urban Wilderness Project. Um, her memoir, Tugging at the Web, um, is forthcoming from the University of Washington Press. So um, Jordan wasn't feeling well tonight and we are sending her um, some healing vibes and we hope she gets better soon. Also, um, not able to join us was um, Wolfberry. And Wolfberry is a non binary digital illustrator who likes looking at felines, but who does not live with actual cats. They are the organizers of the Rainbow on the East Side Pride Art Show. And while they are not drawing cats, they enjoy reading historical and fictional accounts of LGBTQIA people in antiquity. So Wolfberry did provide us with um, a video of um, her comments, her, her love and her objects of pride. Um, so Rachel, I believe is going to chime in here and provide us with the video. Hello, I'm Wolfberry, a non-binary illustrator who runs Wolfberry Studio. I use they them pronouns. 
I'm a person of East Asian descent with brown eyes and short black hair. I am wearing a gray jacket and a black cap with cat ears. Behind me is a movie poster for Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee and Jim Kelly in it. I would like to thank the committee at KCLS and Mohai for presenting the Objects of Pride program. I enjoyed listening to the Mohai community share stories of their Objects of Pride, and I'm excited to be part of this. My Objects of Pride are three queer books that came to me through allies who were present at different times in my life. I will describe the book covers in detail and show a closer view of each of them in the following slides. The first book that I'm sharing is Dust in the Wind. The book cover has two Chinese characters, Feng Chen, for the title. There is a young man in medieval Chinese clothing in the foreground. In the background, there is a long-haired young man surrounded by magnolia flowers. The text on the cover includes the author's name, Qing Lan, and the illustrator's name, Din Si Chue. This is a fantasy romance about a mortal man who devotes himself to an immortal over two lifetimes. It is number 77 in a series of boys' love romance novels published in Taiwan. I bought this book and others like it during a period when I was witnessing racism in the larger LGBTQ community and homophobia in some Asian immigrant circles. At a time of double marginalization, it was important for me to be surrounded by visual representations of stories that are both queer and Asian. So I bought a small stack of these books just for the cover art. Because the vendor from whom I ordered these books was not shipping to the United States, I had these gay novels shipped to my parents' address. They held on to the books for me until I went to visit them. It did cross my mind that my parents might have something to say when I splurged on a bunch of fiction books. As to whether that actually happened or not, I will tell you on the next slide, which has pictures of my parents and me. There are three photos on this slide. The first photo shows an elderly man and an elderly woman of East Asian descent standing in front of a rhododendron bush. In the second photo, there is an androgynous younger person standing next to the man. In the third photo, the androgynous person is standing next to the woman. To give some context, my parents experienced food and housing insecurity during their childhoods. My own childhood was easier than theirs, even though we lived paycheck to paycheck and were careful with our food budget. My parents valued frugality. Even after their children started making their own money, my parents preferred that we save our money instead of buying them modest gifts. To my mild surprise, my parents took my non-essential romance book purchases pretty well. Regardless of what they thought of my spending decision, they accepted that these were the objects of pride that I needed at that time. I am thankful for my parents with whom I never had to hide who I was. Now we are moving on to the next slide, which is about the second book that I'm sharing with you. Precious Mirror for Ranking Flowers is a novel written by the 19th century author Chen Sun. A gay acquaintance from China gave me this book. Although I have lost touch with this acquaintance, I am grateful that we were able to share the journey of being queer and Asian for a while. On the book cover, there is a female presenting young person in a pink dress, wearing a flower in their hair. Standing behind them is a young man in a blue robe, holding a folding fan. There is a lamp and an incense burner in the background. The book's title is Four Chinese Characters, P, 
品或宝剑 ，meaning precious mirror for ranking flowers. Other text on the cover indicates that the publisher is Sibei University and that the book is a famous work of classical literature. The setting is 18th century Beijing's gay scene, which was centered on the theater. Through the lives of a few dozen characters, Precious Mirror explored a variety of same-sex relationships in the actor patronage scene, ranging from romantic devotion to exploitative situations. An idealized gay couple in the story is Mei Ziyu, a young man of gentry background, and Du Qinyan, an actor who plays female roles. A second pair of male lovers in the story, Tian Chun Hang and Su Hui Fang, servant Pi Yuan and his longtime companion, the actor Li Gui Guan, who was nicknamed Pi Yuan's wife. Precious Mirror was published in China in 1849. For comparison, some candidates for first American gay novel are Ethel's Love Life, published in 1859, Joseph and His Friend, published in 1870, and Marsh Island, published in 1885. In Precious Mirror for Ranking Flowers and Pre 20th Century Chinese Literature in General, Bisexual men are the most prominently represented part of the LGBTQIA spectrum. Folklore and historical records mention bisexual women, asexual people, intersex people, and exclusively homosexual people to a lesser degree. There was the occasional mention of transgender people with binary gender identities, but I rarely. See non-binary people like myself having a central role in the old Chinese stories. On that topic, we are moving on to the next slide, which is the last book that I'm sharing. The Black Tides of Heaven is the first young adult novel in the Tenseret series by Mion Yang, a non-binary Singaporean author. The book cover has J Y Yang for the author's name. But they changed their name recently and is now known as Mion Young. The cover shows a young East Asian person with wind-blown black hair sitting cross-legged on a blue cloud. They are wearing black robes. In the background, there are mountains and clouds against a black sky. There is a quote from Ken Liu near the top of the cover: "Full of love and loss, confrontation and discovery. Each moment is a glistening pearl." All strung together in a wonder of world creation. The Black Tides of Heaven is set in a fantasy world that incorporates influences from East Asian, South Asian, and Southeast Asian cultures. Everyone in that universe starts life as agender individuals with they them pronouns. Some individuals choose a binary gender and different pronouns later in life. Some don't. Bisexual, gay, lesbian, and heterosexual characters are represented in the Tenseret novels. This book and its sequel was a gift to me from a non-binary Southeast Asian American community educator who believes in writing the stories that we want to read. And it seems that the author Neon Young did just that. The Black Tides of Heaven and the other three books in the Tenseret series are available through KCLS. I am grateful for the amazing people in my life and the gifts that they gave. This is the last slide in my presentation. Thank you for listening, and thanks again to the wonderful team at KCLS and Mohai for putting this event together. Be well. And I am grateful for Wolfberry for sharing、um, that story, and you know it just goes to show the incredible power that books、um, have in shaping our our, our chosen identity. And、um, so, but as a librarian, I'm also biased. But、um, what an incredible story!、Um, up next, we have、um, a very special guest as well,、um, Rosette Royale. Rosette Royale is a writer and storyteller, 
storyteller based in Seattle whose work has appeared on rollingstone.com as well as local radio stations such as KNX, KNKX and KUOW. He's working on a book about being a black person who overcame a fear of the wilderness to explore the Olympic temperate rainforest. Rosette, welcome. Hello, hello, hello. It's nice to be here and uh, it's a great honor. I'd like to thank KCLS and Mohai. I see we have an image there, but I'm going to describe myself for you. So my name is Rosette. I am a black individual, pronouns she, he, they. I have black dreads, which are braided into ponytails that are forward facing. I'm wearing an orange shirt and I have gold glasses and a gray goatee. And because Chris was here and Chris was so great and spoke about the power of hoop earrings, I went and my partner found some hoop earrings of mine. So they're really big hoop earrings and they have nice rhinestones on them. I love these earrings. I'm sitting in a room, white walls and on the back wall is a photo of a bee pollinating a rosemary bush. So. Objects of pride. Well, here we go. Uh, let's talk about this object that I have is this gown that I'm wearing. Now, this gown, you're going to see some pictures. You're going to see, uh, you know, me doing a not so much a model runway because I didn't make a video. But anyway, we just have some still shots here. Uh, we can just move on to the next one. Uh, so we have shots of me in this gown. This is a gown that I wore in 2006 for a May Day ceremony called Ravenna Ravine. So here in Seattle, which is where I live, there is a park called Ravenna Park. It's in the northern part of the city. It is north of the Univ University District. It's beautiful, gorgeous place. You know, there's like an upper park, a nice field where you can throw a frisbee, play soccer, and then it goes down into basically like a ravine and there's a nice walk, multiple paths through this lovely, quiet, beautiful green area. And so, uh, and uh, let's see, when did it start? In 1989, there was the first Ravenna Ravine. And so it was a May Day ceremony. So May Day is a time where you honor spring. And also, uh, it's an ancient pagan festival ritual to honor spring. And but also these days, May Day is also known as the is uh, known as the March for Workers and Immigrants' Rights. So we were there for the pagan festival, and in 1989, it began. began it was uh, started by a group of gay men, and so they had the idea that anyone could embody the goddess of the ravine. So each year what would happen around May Day, it's on the first Sunday in May, generally, they would have someone who would embody the goddess. And in 2006, I embodied the goddess. And so what happens is people gather in a great big circle in the soccer field area and around high noon on that Sunday, they all call out to the goddess, Ravenna Ravine, Ravenna Ravine. And they keep calling and calling and calling and they call out the goddess. And then the goddess runs up from the ravine and greets all the people who are there and gives an invocation of the day. So I was the 18th goddess in 2006. And how the, I guess you could say the circuit worked <laughs> and circuit may mean something to a number of queer people out here. But how the circuit worked was that like a coven of witches, there would be 13 in a coven. So the first coven had 13. And then the 14th year, they celebrated all the goddesses in coven one. And then the 15th year, they started with coven two. So I was in the second coven, again, the 18th goddess in 2006. And I came out in this dress, and this dress was made by another goddess, uh, this fantastic seamstress, <laughs> I'll call them. And so you see, you know, we uh, sat down and talked about what this dress might involve. And, you know, we looked through a lot of fashion magazines and sat there 
and I wanted something that was a little form fitting. And I'm just gonna say that the pictures that you're seeing right now, even though I wore the dress originally in 2006, this is me in the dress just a few weeks ago. So I'm still able to get in that dress, which surprised me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm a big fan of faux fur, right? As I think many queens can be. And so I wanted some faux fur. So it's got a nice faux fur trim. You can see that it also has a nice big poof underneath. That's because it's got crinoline in the background. Now you can just uh, scroll through the rest of these images because yes, there we go. Oh, well, there you go. Now you can come back to me actually live because that was how the dress looked on me. But you know what? I also have the dress here. It's huge. Look at this. You can't even see me because the dress is so big. <laughs> so this is the gown I wore. Here's a little crinoline underneath. Now, when I was the 18th goddess um, in 2006, I was the first black goddess that there was. And uh, there had been an indigenous uh, goddess uh, several years before. And so I was the first black goddess. And uh, my idea was to really have it be a celebration of people. And one of the things that can happen during a Ravenna Ravine ceremony is that everyone calls out the goddess, the goddess gives an invocation, and then the goddess goes into the ravine and people walk by the goddess is standing someplace and people can walk by and get a blessing. But I thought, you know what? When I go places with my family, the way that we grew up, we always went around to people's little places to talk to them. So I thought, I don't want the people to come to me. I wanna go to the people. So we have a moment uh, where we say some words to the crowd. And then what happens is we go to another sort of, um, field like area, another soccer field on the other end of the park. And we have a picnic together. And so everyone brings food, we feast together. And that was the point where I went around and I decided to see everyone, to talk to everyone. Now, you know, I'm talking about going around and talking to people and being the goddess and this big ravine and walking around outside. And you know, when Chris talked about like, it's always good to have a pair of hoops, it's always good to have a nice pair of shoes. And so if you'll, you may not have noticed in the photo, but it's just like me and bare feet. But I had one of my favorite pairs of shoes that I wore with this gown. And they were these sort of, uh, let's say plum colored uh, velvet platform shoes. And I loved these shoes. Now, for any of the people who live around here, you know that like early May, it can be sort of like not, no, not so nice weather. Well, maybe it is nice, but it's kind of rainy. <laughs> but I was like, I'm going to wear these platform shoes. So I wore these platform shoes. The forecast was that it was going to be 50 degrees and rainy. And so I was like, I got to wear long underwear under this gown and have some hose for my shoes. Well, somehow, maybe it was the goddess, uh, an hour before we gathered, the sun came out and it like turned to 70 degrees and it was sunny and it was beautiful. And I had these platform shoes on in this big gown and I was thrilled and I was like running. I mean, I was actually running through the ravine and these platform shoes and I'm running and I'm running. And then <laughs> one of the shoes broke. I mean, the platform just went and the shoe broke and I kind of tumbled to the ground, right? I wasn't hurt, but I stuck my leg up in the air because my shoe was broken and I couldn't, you know, a queen can walk around with no shoe. Well, luckily, there was a very, uh, how do we say, um, someone who must have been perhaps a scout in some life was very prepared and had duct tape and duct tape my shoe. <laughs> and I was able to perform as the goddess the rest of the day and the shoe. And then we ended that day with a maypole. 
and there were a like, hundred people gathered in this maypole in the sun. It was beautiful. We had a lovely time. We feasted. We were there together for hours. And then I'm not lying. About 15 minutes after it was all done, the clouds came and it rained. So I can't show you those shoes because I broke one. But I decided if I would have had another pair of shoes, I would have worn these. And what shoes would I have worn? That's right. That's right. These gold glitter platform pumps. That's what a real goddess should wear, honey. So I know that my gown was like my object of pride, but I just got inspired listening to Chris. And I was like, if I could have a second object of pride, <laughs> this would be it, baby. This would be it. And just because, and just to prove that I have both of them, there's the other. So, ah. <laughs> let me take a moment. Uh, so, it was great to be a goddess in the city. And, you know, Ravenna Ravine is really great because it brings all kinds of people together. Young, I mean, there are kids there who are like two and three and four. And there are older people and everyone is dressing up. And as I said, it was started by gay men, but the but times change, right? And so there were white gay men and who began it, but then here comes an indigenous queer, and then here comes a black queer, and then um, representations of gender identity start to weave themselves into the idea notion of a goddess just like the maypole, just like we weave the ribbons in the maypole, all sorts of identities begin to be woven into the idea of a goddess. So there is my object of pride. It's really objects, a gown, an old gown with nice cuffs and fabulous purple velvet <laughs> sleeves and my lovely goddess boots. Objects of pride, honey. Objects of pride. Lovely to share them with you all this evening. Thank you, Rosette. Um, I have now discovered or heard of the six millionth use for duct tape <laughs> for the shoes because otherwise it would have been a goddess tra tragedy. Honey. But you saved the day. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that story and, and for sharing your objects. At this point, I'd like to um, ask if Chris can join us um, as well, if he can um, uh, turn on his camera. Thank you, Chris. Um, Hello. And I do invite um, our our attendees to use the um, Q&A uh, feature or the chat feature, we'll be monitoring both um, to ask questions of our panelists, um, our distinguished panelists um, who so graciously um, shared um, their stories. I guess the first question that I have for you, for you both is what raises an object um, to that status because we come across so many objects throughout our lifetimes and some of those are get relegated to you know just kind of either ephemera or kind of trinkets but there are those there's those things that you know rise to that status of being an object of pride um either one of you want to chime in chris please uh, <laughs> oh, okay, Rosette. So first, first of all, when you were like, I know Chris said something about you need a good pair of hoops, and you were like, you always need a good pair of shoes. You should have heard me. I was like, period, period, girl. <laughs> um, I when I was invited uh, to speak about an object, it was kind of hard to. That was honestly the big question I had because on the website I was seeing a lot of um stuff that you could consider, you know historical objects, stuff you can put up in a museum. Um, but then I spoke with, I think, Joe and Nicole, uh, and they really just kind of 
flesh it out for me that um, this object can also be, you know, a personal memento of sorts that uh, me, uh, let's see, sorry, uh, that trying to, that there's no reason to just stick to the whole, you know, black and white, clean cut, it has to be a historical object, the common definition of historical. Um, we're talking about queer history here and whatever his, whatever you're going through through your um, in your own life as a queer person is part of queer history. Um, you're writing your history uh, and so you're writing a part of the, of the community's history as a whole. So I thought that was cute and <laughs> it helped me figure out my objects much uh, like much easier. So that's what I would say. You know, I am not a person that I mean, I'm about to say this, and maybe I'm totally not even looking at who I really am. You know, I don't actually believe that I'm uh, someone who has a lot of objects. Like, I don't tend to hold on to a lot of things, except books and sweaters and drag clothes are the things okay. that I hold on to, right? So I have drag outfits that I have been dragging around, <laughs> dragging around with me for like years, no matter where I go. So then when I heard about this program, I was like, oh, an object of pride. And then I just had to think about something that, well, it tells a story. It is a story in and of itself. And also it's like been sitting in a big bin just waiting to come back out. So suddenly I was like, oh, right, that that gown and so I realized there was a whole story and about me and the city was all in this one thing so I realized and I think we can realize this about things that hold great meaning in our hearts that like the meanings are layered mm -hmm. just like Chris was talking about hoops and all the many layers of just a just like hoops right so I think that's what happens is that objects become infused with meaning and not just one, but multiple meanings. And that sort of lifts them up as something you, you would love to share with someone else. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to follow up on that and maybe kind of go back to, um, you know, Chris's story as well, how you know, for many of us, um, whether you're a gay man or, 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 or you know, trans, transitioning, wh wherever you are on that GLBTQIA spectrum, that we have these objects um, that also convey courage throughout our lives because it took courage um, in many instances to wear or to have or to display that object in, in a time or a place maybe that maybe was not as um, welcoming um, to us. Um, have you, any of you ever been in that position? Uh, like Rosette was saying, same thing here. It was also hard to figure out an object because I'm not, I don't really cling on to um, many things. I don't have a lot of things that I hold on to. Uh, I forget who was saying earlier, uh, you know, parents just kind of pack everything up and, you know, we go to the next place. So you just pack the essentials. Uh, shoot. And I forgot your question, Jose. I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> that sometimes our, our objects can be a symbol of courage. Right, right. Uh, I think that's why I really kind of decided to cling on to the whole, uh, to the pair of hoops was because honestly, if I'm, I'm looking at skirts, I'm looking at hula skirts, I'm looking at necklaces and um, like this pride flag that I have folded up and I'm like, what? <laughs> probably gonna be two other people doing a pride flag. Um, the hoops just felt more heavy, you know, there was more of this, this like draw towards it. And um, I'm honestly glad for this opportunity because I never really gave the hoops much thought until I had to sit down and really just start fleshing it out. like. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, makes me, I don't know, just different to finally have a chance to sit down and be more introspective about uh, your journey and 
um, how certain little things here and there, uh, while small, have really uh, kind of defined and have gone along with you throughout your time. And I don't know, I just think that's beautiful. Here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I am 53. And I grew up in when I was a child, when my favorite person, well, one of my favorite people was my sister. And my sister is 12 years, 12, 12 years older than I am. And she was a fantabulous dresser. And our next door neighbor was like the same age as her. And those two sisters worked in the 70s. They worked. And I realized as a kid that clothes can be powerful based upon how they looked. And so, and you know, I didn't, I didn't sit down and go, wow, clothes are powerful. It was just something that sort of just kind of infused into my being. And then as I uh, got older and realized my queerness and came out as queer, one of the things I did was I worked as a drag queen for a while. And I realized, yes, honey. And I realized how much power an outfit has and how people can react to clothes. And so it reminded me of my sister. And I realized how much courage people get from being able to embody something through their outfit, through their clothes in a way they feel they may not be able to express every day when they're just going through their daily life but they may have a few hours in a club or they may have a few hours at a festival where suddenly they get to show another part of themselves and their clothes are infused with power and they and the clothes infuse them with power. And so doing drag like actually mm -hmm. taught me to be courageous. It really did. Because it was like, you don't have to think about anything. You just go out there and be. Mm -hmm. And that was an amazing thing to learn as a young queer person. It really was. Absolutely. Power to the outfit. Yes, honey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, do have a, we do have a question from one of our um, attendees. So um, to, uh, to both of you, have you ever lost an object that had sentimental value to you? And if so, how did you deal with it? was that so oh. have you ever had an object that you've lost that had sentimental value and how did you deal with it i'm thinking now let me think oh i did oh okay so <laughs> i used to live in provincetown massachusetts it's a small town on the tip of uh cape cod and province and um massachusetts and it's a uh, artist colony, but in the summer, it's also like a queer Mecca, right? So I was there in the 20s. That's really where I started doing a lot of drag. Um, and there are a lot of fantastic artists there. And one artist there was a milliner, a milliner. He was a hat maker. He made these fabulous hats. And he designed this hat for me that was like leopard print on the outside and red faux fur on the inside. And, you know, I had dreads then too. And it had a hole in the top and I would stick my dreads in the top of the hat. So <laughs> then they would come out and hang out of the hat. And oh, I loved this hat so much. And then one time I went to visit a friend in New York City and I took the hat and it was hot on the bus. I took the hat off and I got off the bus and I was walking to the subway station and I realized I didn't have the hat. No. And then the bus was gone. And uh -oh. I was devastated. I mean, I was wrecked. I mean, you go to New York City to have a good time, but I had a horrible time that whole weekend because I grieved, I couldn't believe it, but I grieved this hat uh, because it was, I had so identified it with myself. And so it was like suddenly I had lost a part of me and I didn't realize how much I had um, attached myself to the hat, how much mm. I had grown mm. to love it. So yeah, I have lost an object that I, oh, I just hadn't remembered that, but ooh, that hurt. 
that hurt. Ooh, I, I, I want to see those gorgeous braids going through that hat. Yes, I honey, I need to make another one. Okay, thank you. We're going to get on that. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> my, um, my very first boyfriend, Chad, uh, first one that I was really out, out with, and he had made this necklace out of, because we love playing video games together. He made it out of an HDMI cable for our Xbox. And he, and he had um, he had a cutout piece of my favorite sweater of his. Um, he had a plastic version of a, he had a plastic hibiscus, because he knows that's my favorite flower on it. Um, and he just went all around, it was gorgeous. And I hung it up in my closet. It was, say, around late 2019, I heard about what, uh, what was going on in Mauna Kea. So I dropped everything in Oahu and I just flew up. And then when I come back, my dad told me, oh, we kind of threw all that shit up. <laughs> and I'm like, this personal <laughs> mementos up in there. You don't even know all my books. And, and the little necklace Chad made me, I was crying. I was just like, oh my god! And rented the room to some fool. I was like, okay, whatever, that's fine. I called him. He's like, can you make me another one? I was like, never mind. It won't be the same. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's dad. You really can't hold it against him, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and Rosette, tech eBay. You never know. That hat might just turn up. <laughs> We do have a we do have a question, um, and so our attendee says I think a lot of about the ways that we connect with our way back and recent queer and trans ancestry and how we are able as youth to connect with queer elders or as elders to connect with youth. What are the ways that you share the stories of your objects and our history with younger LGBTQIA folks? Uh, I'm gonna let the elder take this. Love <laughs> <laughs> <Right>, you. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, let me say that I don't actually feel like an elder yet. But the thing I've found from most elders is that they actually don't feel like they are elders. Many of them are like, "I'm not an elder. What do you mean?" <laughs> um, well, you know, I really think well I here's one way right like Chris was talking about hoops and so I also realized that he that that was right and so I think one thing an elder can do is to let the younger queers know when they are right right you were mm. right you know I mean I want to tell a positive stories but I guess this is a story which may not be so positive in some way and so when I um one of my earliest uh, gay pride parades that I went to was in Boston so it's in June it's a nice day Chris I love hoops too I had these gold hoops on I had uh -huh. this white frilly shirt and I had some jean hot pants on and then I oh, had construction yeah. boots and so, <laughs> well, you know, oh I was I was trying to fem it all up and everything with my boots so I could work down the street. Right. And I was right. working down the street and I remember I was there with some other friends and you know, this man walked by us and just spewed this homophobic rant. And it was horrible. Right. And I just remember we standing up to him and talking back to him. And you know, this is 1991 or so. Mm. Um but I guess I'm remembering that because I think the other part about being an elder talking to the youth is also I remember if I could talk to myself then that queer in 1991, I would just remind that queer of how what you're doing is so important. Being out here, being seen, being visible, being vocal right? And not letting someone dictate how you should be is so important. So I guess I think when I speak to like younger queers today, in a way, I'm really just speaking to the younger queer that's me, mm. right? Because I see myself 
And so when Chris talks about earrings, I hear my own story about earrings. And so that's why I wanted to go get these. So I mm -hmm. think that for me, it's like speaking to the young me and just reminding young me, which is still here, which is still in this heart, mm -hmm. reminding me how to keep moving forward in this world. Chris, any thoughts? Um, at the moment, you know, I'm 22 years old and I don't think my parents oversee this, but I do have some, you know, about a handful of queer siblings. I'm the oldest of seven. And uh, while they're kind of doing the whole closet thing, um, I hate that that's all I can do for them is just kind of be there while they're in the closet. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole plan is, you know, when you're on your own, um, that's you, that's your life. Whether mom and dad is, you know, in denial of who you really are, just don't forget. Don't try to put on a performance like I've been doing for years now. Um, you know, at least not in, when you're in front of mom and dad and you don't feel like going through the emotional baggage of like, you know, trying to just be yourself. Uh, when you're out there, know that, you know, the world is yours. Um, I'm still figuring out things for myself as a young, you know, queer person. So I don't have all the answers for you, but just know, like, I'm here for you, babe. And what's the worst you can do? Burn down a building. Um, and, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I think just being here and letting them know that, hey, if you don't have access to any queer elders, you do have access to technically like a queer elder. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just, yeah, just just being here is really what I can do for them. I do have some, I have some friends who still aren't out of the closet. And, you know, they'll ask me questions about, it's like, how did you approach your parents? And like, I did not approach my parents. It happened and it was a whole fucking snowstorm, blizzard. Um, and like, you get over it. And I think just telling them, you know, put your head down. If, if your school is your thing, focus on school and just make sure to work your way towards independence. And once you're out, um, you get it. I feel like I should be a better revolutionary queer elder and tell them, no, get up in your parents' face, get up in whoever, like whoever your guardian's face and, you know, tell them who you are. And if they won't have it, then, you know, bye. But um, I don't want to, I don't want them to risk their living situation um, for a moment of, you know, freedom. It's like, you, you got to approach this logistically and yeah. <laughs> you know so yeah yeah that's no I, I a lot of that resonates with um you know my own experience and and how I I, don't, I didn't necessarily set out to you know to share my story with you know my family or friends but I think it was just by being your by being yourself by being your authentic self and 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 you know hoping that um you know that that story or that experience will will both will will be a lasting one and a memory not only for you but for those who are um, around you as well. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, I wish we could do this. Um, no, actually, you know what? I'm going to recommend that we do this again. Um, and thank you to Jordan Keith and um, Wolfberry who couldn't be with yeah. us, but um, you know, Rosette and um, Chris, what an incredible stories. Thank you so much again to our Mohai partners and my um, KCLS colleagues. It's been a privilege and an honor. Thank you so much. Bye, thank you everybody. Bye, thank you. Thank Bye. you so much. Really, really appreciated it. I, ah, so many feelings. <laughs> I'm so glad this is recorded so I can watch it again. Thank you to Chris and Rosette for your stories. And thank you so much to KCLS. Um, and I just wanna read off the names of some of the planning team because this has been a month long effort to put this together. Um, so thank you to Joe Anderson, Jen C. Brickle, Nicole Robert, Mary Dempsey, as well as Jose Garcia and Melissa Mather who are on um, here. Just all of you have been wonderful. We really, really uh, appreciate the chance to bring these stories. And 
thank you for everybody on this call. And I know that you all have stories too, and we would love to hear them. So this is your official uh, ask that if you want to share your story, please go on social media and tag both Mohai and KCLS and use the hashtag objects of pride. And um, we would love to hear from you. Um, we are also going to do another co-presented uh, program with KCLS in June, uh, continuing this objects of pride theme that's gonna be more of a workshop. And so if you want to not just share on social media, but actually get to talk to other folks who have objects and stories, um, this is going to be a Zoom room workshop. Um, and again, it's in June. So that gives you lots of time to think about what objects you might want to share. And hopefully, as tonight, as you're um, hearing Chris say, sometimes it seems like some of the things we might have up on our, we have an Objects of Pride website that we will put in the uh, chat and a lot of them are things in the Mohai collection that are museum worthy, but it doesn't have to be uh, something, it, it, it can be anything that has a person, exactly <laughs> anything that has a personal meaning to you that makes you feel pride and makes you feel um, at home in your LGBTQ identity. Um, so please consider coming. Uh, we would love to have you. Thank you so much to our storytellers. Thank you so much to KCLS. And have a lovely night, everyone. Stay safe. Hope to see you online soon. Yeah.